Senator from New Hampshire. I wanted to rise in support of the Saxby Shambliss Amendment, Senator Shambliss from Georgia, and express my concern, my very serious concerns about the language which has been brought forward by the chairman of the committee uh, of both, both the Agriculture Committee and the Banking Committee relative to derivatives. Let's begin with what our purpose should be here. Let's remember that derivatives, as has been said before on this floor numerous times, I think the Senator from Alabama said it extraordinarily well, are a critical part of how Main Street maintains its economic vitality. You know, credit is what makes America work. I mean, one of the great geniuses of our society is that we are able to produce credit in a fairly readily ready manner, which is reasonably priced, and which people who wish to take risk can take advantage of in order to create economic activity and jobs. And the oil that basically keeps the credit available in the American capitalist system is derivatives, for all intents and purposes. As has been pointed out, if you're, if you're manufacturing an item somewhere in America, and you enter into a contract to sell that item, let's say overseas, there are a lot of risks on how you're going to make money on that item, which you have no control over. Let's say you make it one day and you're gonna sell it six months later. Uh, you enter into the contract, when you get the order, you produce it six months later. There's a lot of risk there that you don't have control over. You know how to manufacture it, you know how to create it, you know it's, if it's something, if it's credit, you know how to produce, produce it. But you don't have control over the exchange rates which you're dealing with. You don't have control over the cost of the raw materials which you're using. You don't have control over whether the various parties that enter into this transaction as it moves through the com commercial stream survive or go out of business or experience some huge economic upset. Well, in order to avoid all of that, and just be the person who wants to produce the good and sell it, you buy derivatives, which are essentially insurance policies to make sure that the risks which you cannot control, you have insurance against. That's, that's derivatives in its simplest form. It also affects all sorts of other instruments, of course, financial instruments and commodity instruments. But basically, it's a capacity of somebody to make an agreement with somebody else and know that that agreement is not going to be affected by outside events, or if the outside events do occur, there's going to be in place a vehicle to protect you from the risks which that outside event may, may create for you. So derivatives are crucial to our capacity as a society to be economically vibrant. <coughs> now we also know that during the economic downturn, during the very severe financial crisis which we had, that the fact that we had so many derivatives in place, which were based off of contracts which were not properly supported, created a huge cascading event which almost forced our entire financial structure to come to a halt. In fact, it did on one evening. And put, was about to put our our economic house into extreme distress because the derivatives markets had not been properly regulated or managed. Now that wasn't the primary cause of <clears throat> the event of the late 2008 period. The primary causes of the events of the late 2008 period were very bad underwriting. In fact, virtually no underwriting standards in some instances for the loans which were being made. <coughs> Easy money and regulatory arbitrage. But the accelerant which took those causes and basically turned it into an event of immense proportions which was going to cause, which, which almost shut down America and would have caused massive dislocation in our nation had it been allowed to go uncontrolled, had the Fed and the Treasury not stepped in and taken very definitive action. The accelerant was the derivatives market. And the classic example of it, of course, was the AIG situation, which has been cited here on the floor numerous times as the example of what was wrong with an unregulated market, where essentially you had a company which was issuing insurance based on its good name. 
virtually nothing else behind the insurance besides its good name. And when that insurance started to get called because the contract started to fail and the counterparties became concerned, there was no capacity to support, support the insurance. So our purpose here should be to reorganize our regulatory structure so that that type of an event doesn't occur again. I mean, that should be our purpose. While at the same time recognizing that we need a very robust and vibrant derivatives market if we're going to be successful as a nation, if we're going to continue to have an economic vitality as a nation. So our goal should be, one, to put in place a structure which as much as possible foresees and limits systemic risk caused by the derivatives market or that could be caused by the derivatives market, and two, maintains an extremely vibrant derivatives market where America remains the best place in the world to create capital and get credit. Unfortunately, the pending bill undermines the second part of that effort. Now, it could be argued the first part of the effort for seeing and trying to anticipate systemic risk is addressed in this bill. But it addresses it in such an unwieldy and unmanageable and in some ways counterproductive way that it actually undermines the basic goal, which is to keep the system sound and also keep the credit markets vibrant. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> there are a number of reasons for it, uh, but the two most difficult parts of this proposal relative to getting it right uh, are the fact that it forces the swap desks to be spun off from the financial houses, and it essentially forces instant movement from and basically almost total coverage of derivatives from, ex from clearing houses into exchanges. Now, in both those instances, you're basically going to create fairly close to the opposite result that you're seeking if you pursue this course. I would predict that if this bill were to become law in its present form, it would be likely that one, a large amount of derivatives activity would move overseas. Two, a large amount of derivative activity which presently occurs and which is necessary for commerce would have to be restructured in a way which would be extraordinarily expensive for the people who do are doing that commerce and would therefore curtail significantly commerce. Three, the credit markets would inherently correct contract by a significant amount of money, probably as much as a three quarters of a trillion dollars. And four, the institutions which would be responsible for creating the derivatives market would actually be less stable. The market makers would be less stable than what we presently have today. Now, you don't have to believe me to understand the seriousness of this and accept this as a statement or an assessment of what the present bill does. Uh, I mean, granted, uh, I'm just one member of this body that has an opinion on it. But we do hire people as a government to take a look at something like this and say, does this work or does that work? And they are charged with the responsibility of accomplishing the two goals which I mentioned. One, avoiding systemic risk, and two, having a vibrant credit market. One of those agencies is the Federal Reserve. They've taken a look at this language in the Dodd Lincoln bill, and they've concluded this. This is their conclusion, Federal Reserve. Section 106 would impair financial stability and strong prudential regulation of derivatives, would have serious consequences for the competitiveness of the United States financial institutions, and would be highly disruptive and costly, both for banks and their customers. That's the conclusion of a fair umpire the Federal Reserve. Now, there are a lot of people around here who don't like the Federal Reserve. But the, we pay them. Their job is to look at something like this and say, does this work or does that work in making our markets more stable, sounder, more risk adverse, and more competitive? Their conclusion is this language does just the opposite, would be highly disruptive and costly for both banks and their customers. But if you don't like the Federal Reserve, 
listen to the FDIC. Now, the FDIC under Sheila Baer during the crisis, which we've just gone through, has probably been one of the best performing agencies in our federal government. They really have stepped in on numerous occasions and stabilized banks which had far overextended their capacity and had gotten into very serious liquidity positions and basically settled those banks out in a way that very few customers lost anything. What did the FDIC say when they looked at this? Because their responsibility is to maintain safety and soundness of banks. Sheila, Chairman of the FDIC, Sheila Baer, in her letter to the, not sure who it went to, check that. Well, I'll have to figure out who it went, went to, but I think it was to members of Congress, said, by concentrating the activity in an affiliate of, insu of the insured banks, and that means spinning them off under the proposal under this bill, we could end up with less and lower quality capital, less information and oversight for the FDIC, and potentially less support for the insured bank in a time of crisis. Thus, one unintended outcome of this provision would be weakened, not strengthened, protection of the insured bank and the deposit insurance fund, which I know is not the result any of us want. Then we have Chairman Volcker, who I think everybody agrees is a fair arbiter around here, and he has also said that this language in this bill overreaches and does not work. And I'll submit his letter to the record. So we have these independent arbitrators, these fair umpires of what we should be doing in order to maintain financial stability and a strong credit markets, saying, listen, don't do it this way. Don't do it this way. There are ways to do this, however. Ways to make sure that we have a strong derivatives market which is also safer, sounder, and is not subject to systemic risk. And Senator Shambliss's bill accomplishes that in a very effective way. How do you basically do it? Well, in concept, you do it this way. You make sure that, for the most part, all the derivatives are cleared. They go through a clearing process. What's a clearing process mean? Well, it basically means that you get counterparties having to put up margin. They have to put up actual assets, margin, liquidity, in order to be sure that there's something behind their position. So that if they have a problem and they have to be called on to pay up their position, they have the capacity to do it and it's there. And that's why you have a clearinghouse. Because the clearinghouse becomes basically the place where that occurs and it becomes the process by which that occurs. And you make sure that the clearinghouse itself, because it, is, it stands in and basically is the guarantor, for lack of a better word, of the contract, that it has the cap and the adequacy to make sure that those contracts will not fail. So as a very practical matter, you can do this by creating a proper structure using clearinghouses. And then to the extent and you make sure the clearinghouses have proper oversight from the SEC or the CFTC. And then, as these instruments, these various derivatives, these various types of derivatives, and there are lots of different types of derivatives, become more standardized, and a lot already are standardized, you move them over to an exchange, which is the ultimate process of making sure that, they, that, they're, that, they're, that you don't have an issue of, uh, of solvency behind behind the instruments. And so, as you move them to an exchange, you are able to create an even stronger market. But you don't mandate that everything go to an exchange right off the door, because if you did that, you'd end up with a lot of derivatives which are still too customized to be able to move to an exchange, and they would simply be not able to be brought forward, and thus you would contract the market again. And you also don't take <clears throat> the swap desks and move them out of the financial houses, because in doing that, you would have to create a whole new capital base for the swap desks, which is the concern here expressed by the Fed and by the FDIC and by Chairman Volcker, which would inevitably force a massive contraction in credit, because that capital would no longer be available to underwrite credit. And in addition, 
you would have much weaker institutions standing behind the swap desks, which is, again, the point made by the Fed, the FDIC, and Chairman Volcker. So it is not necessary to go down the route that's outlined in this bill in order to accomplish the goals which we all have. In fact, if you go down the route uh, presented in this bill, you actually undermine the goals which we all have, which is to have a more a, a derivatives market which is less prone to systemic risk and which is strong, sound, and vibrant. Rather, what Senator Shambliss has proposed makes the most sense, which is a comprehensive reform of the derivatives market in a way that insists that for the vast majority of derivatives, they end up going through a clearinghouse process. And that if they're standardizable, they end up on an exchange. If they're for purely a commercial purpose, a single purpose commercial undertaking, then they're able to be exempt from the clearing activity. This would create a much more robust undertaking of, credit, of creation of credit in this country. It would maintain the vitality of the derivatives market in this country while at the same time protecting and making sure that we, we, had, a, we had a sound derivatives market. It would avoid what I believe the inevitable outcome of this language would be under the Dodd-Lincoln bill, which is that we would weaken the derivatives market, weaken the systemic protections, and end up forcing overseas a large amount of economic activity which appropriately should be done here in the United States, and which is very important to our nation's capacity to be competitive on Main Street. And remember, this is about Main Street. So I certainly hope people will support Senator Shambliss's proposal. It makes a lot of sense. It's well thought out. It's not exactly what I would do were I writing this myself, but it's a very good piece of legislation. And it should be supported, and I would hope that uh, my colleagues would, would do so. Mr. President, I yield the floor.